This is every comic book from 1966 that features Spider-Man, a compilation of the recaps that I put together every Thursday as I tried to read every Spider-Man ever. It's also the year that Steve Ditko left Amazing Spider-Man and it's also during this period where I lost all of the videos that I'd ever made, had a little bit of a crisis and decided to use it as an excuse to rebrand. Enjoy! It's Amazing Spider-Man issue 32. In an underwater base, the Master Planner curses Spider-Man, and we finally learn who they are. Dr. Octopus, who wants to use radiation to become one of the most feared humans in the world. He just needs a few more pieces of equipment and orders his men to steal anything radioactive coming into the city. On the surface, Peter Parker is at the Daily Bugle to sell photographs when he bumps into Betty and Ned Leeds. Since Betty will never love him as Spider-Man, he decides to play the cad, claiming Betty was just good for a few laughs and getting physical with Ned when he tries tries to get Peter to be nice to Betty. This approach will hurt Betty, he thinks, but hopefully it will get her to move on from Peter. But she refuses to move on. She knows that he's not really like this. With Betty still pining after him, Peter arrives at the hospital to visit his sick aunt. There, a doctor tells Peter what the problem is. Somehow, radioactivity has gotten into her bloodstream. The doctors are baffled about how it could have happened, but Peter thinks he knows. It was the blood transfusion that he gave her months ago. Somehow, the radioactivity that turned him into Spider-Man is killing his aunt. At home, Peter wrecks the place in anger, thinking himself responsible for both of his parent figures dying. But he has to do something, and he knows just the person who'll help, Dr. Kurt Connors, the man formerly known as the Lizard. And lucky for Peter, Connors has recently moved from Florida to New York. So as Spider-Man, Peter steals his aunt's blood sample and races to Dr. Connors, explaining the issues that a friend is having. And Connors has a solution, a radioactive chemical known as ISO 36. It's expensive, but Spidey says he'll find a way to to afford it and asks Connors to get some as soon as possible. And to afford it, Peter Parker pawns off all of his scientific equipment. Unfortunately, the ISO 36 is stolen by the Master Planner's gang as it arrives by plane. When Spidey learns about the theft, he knows immediately who's responsible, but doesn't know where the Master Planner is hiding. So he swings to the bugle looking for Foswell, scaring Betty in the process, and finds Foswell in the streets below. He tells him to find out who the Master Planner is, and that he'll share the story with him, and then he swings away for a hunt of his own. Spider-Man tears apart gang after gang, looking for information, no longer the quippy hero and instead a whirlwind of violence. The kid gloves are off as Aunt May slips into a coma. Eventually, Spidey discovers a secret door that leads to a group of purple men that work with the Master Planner. Spidey takes them apart easily and finds reinforcements coming through another hidden door, so he jumps through that just in time in search for the ISO 36. But little does he know that he's walking into the Master Planner's trap. Spider-Man finds his way into a large room filled with machinery and with the ISO 36 on easy display. But when he moves towards it, he's electrocuted and falls to the ground. Dr. Octopus springs his surprise, ready to defeat Spider-Man. But he doesn't account for a Spidey on a timescale with a dying aunt. And our superhero fights back hard and relents little. Spidey is so vicious that Doc Ock flees, but also so vicious that he smashes the main support beam for the equipment and it all falls down on top of him. Trapped under this equipment, some of it weighing as much as a locomotive, Motive, Spider-Man is inches away from the ISO 36. He watches as water begins to drip from the ceiling, the river above ready to flood in, powerless to stop it. He is lost, too weak and too tired to lift anything off of himself. Elsewhere, his dying aunt whispers his name. Elsewhere, Doc Connors frets that they're running out of time for the antidote to work. Elsewhere, purple men guard the exit to the chamber, and Spider-Man sinks down in defeat. He has failed. Amazing Spider-Man issue 33 so let's recap. Aunt May is dying in the hospital. The cure for her illness is being manufactured by Dr. Connors, but he needs one final ingredient. That ingredient, ISO 36, is just an arm length away from Spider-Man. Unfortunately, the room he's in is starting to flood and there are guards at the door and he's trapped under tons of equipment. This issue is called the final chapter for a reason, except even though he's defeated, Spider-Man can't help but think about his Aunt May and how he's her only hope and how he let his Uncle Ben down and within himself, despite all the odds, he begins to rise. The stress of tons of metal is enormous. The feet 
almost impossible. He's close to blacking out from the strain, but little by little Spider-Man lifts tons of machinery from himself before breaking himself free, a hero once more. But his leg is badly wounded and the room is flooding fast. With the ISO 36 in hand, Spidey decides that there's no use fighting, going limp and letting the water carry him when it bursts into the room instead. Using his agility, he avoids the debris in the water and at the last moment before drowning, he surfaces for air. Except he's pulled back into the water by those purple men that work for the master planner and even though he can defeat them by pulling their air hoses out, he finds more waiting for him on the surface. He tries to fight but he's outnumbered and weak and injured and he falls under the weight of their blows. But as he falls, he thinks of his Aunt May again, waiting for him and he fights on without thinking, defeating the purple men without even noticing and then limps on to Dr. Connors. Spider-Man and Connors finish off the antidote, testing it on Spidey's blood to see if it works before Spider-Man swings to the hospital and Connors calls ahead to let them know of Spidey's arrival. The doctors accept the antidote and perform a blood transfusion but it'll be two hours before they know anything and that's too long for Spider-Man to wait around and worry. So he swings back to the master planner's base to stage some photographs, then informs Foswell of the unconscious henchmen and takes pictures of their arrest too. He's now square with Foswell and Jonah is jubilant that his paper has the exclusive on the arrests. As Peter limps to Jonah's office to sell him the photographs, Betty chases him down. But when she finds him wounded from taking photographs and adamant that it's important to him, Betty falls out of love with Peter, reminded of her dead brother and his eagerness to put himself in danger. And in Jonah's office, Jonah is so desperate for the photographs that Peter took that Peter gets to negotiate a high price, enough for him to pay for May's medical bills and to buy back the equipment that Peter sold to get her the antidote. And then, with his business done, Peter's back at the hospital and he learns that his aunt is fine, that her blood has come back clean. She's going to be okay. As she sleeps, Peter limps home exhausted, as the doctors wonder why more people can't be like this young kid Peter instead of the thrill seekers like Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man issue 34 Craven the Hunter has a bust on his wall, waiting to wear a Spidey mask when Craven finally hunts and kills the wall crawler. And that's what he's going to do today, so he practices by drinking a magic potion and wrestling a lion. Elsewhere, Peter Parker reveals his secret identity to Betty, except that not really, it's just Betty having a nightmare. She consoles herself that there's no way that Peter could be Spider-Man, she just wishes that she could guess the actual secret that's keeping them apart. Later, at college, Gwen Stacy is beset with suitors, and Peter is finally ready to embrace the other students there. He was distant because his aunt was ill, but now that she's well and at home, Peter can finally make friends. Except that Harry Osborn just won't let him. Peter can't be cold and distant one moment and then just expect to be nice and have everything change. Gwen feels conflicted though. Maybe he had a reason to be distant, but she thinks that Peter's more interested in his science than a girl like her. At home time, Peter has to stop himself from stopping crime. He needs to be home with his recovering Aunt May, not spider manning around the city. But that might all have to change because Craven is plotting in the chameleon's old lair. And, completely unconnected, Spider-Man, and definitely not Craven in disguise, attacks J. Jonah Jameson in the streets. The public are disgusted. Spider-Man really is a criminal. And that's news for the real Spider-Man, who was relaxing at home with his aunt. But he can't go chasing after this imposter. He needs to look after May. It's especially since she's just recovered from having radioactive blood, which was not as fun as the theme song makes it sound. And so, while Peter is stuck at home, the spider imposter continues to harass Jonah over the coming days, and Jonah low-key loves it because he's now selling even more papers. Luckily for Peter, Mrs. Watson arrives one evening to chat with May, and he can sneak away to become his alter ego. But his hunt for the fake Spidey is not much of a hunt, because that fake Spidey wants to be found, shining a spider signal to draw the attention of Peter. It's so obvious that a gang in the streets below see it and head up to the building to beat up that criminal Spider-Man and claim some of the reward. Spider-Man, the real one, reaches the rooftop where he saw the light and the fake Spider-Man reveals himself to be Craven, of course. Craven sprays Spider-Man with a special pheromone spray designed to dull his spider sense and then leads our hero onto a chase through a booby-trapped building, traps that Spider-Man can no longer sense. The chase leads down into the building where Spider-Man comes face to face with that gang from before, looking for a payday. 
day, Spider-Man fights the men that attack and then escapes through a window, realising too late that his dulled spider sense is tingling and getting grappled by Kraven. But there's more of the gang, so Spider-Man stops fighting Kraven and Kraven stops fighting Spider-Man so they can both take out the gang together. And with that gang finally defeated, Kraven gets the drop on Spider-Man, landing on him from above. But Spider-Man's jokey attitude enrages the hunter, enough to make him sloppy, enough to let Spider-Man land just one blow. He follows that one blow up with more hits and eventually Spider-Man triumphs over Kraven the Hunter. After webbing Kraven and the gang up for the police, Peter Parker thinks about taking pictures to sell to the Daily Bugle. But that would mean running into Betty Brant and losing her is too much for him to deal with right now, so he goes home instead. Later, and because he is a man of honour, Kraven admits to impersonating Spider-Man, showing the evidence to the police. It drives J. Jonah Jameson angry. Once again, Spider-Man comes out looking like a hero. His anger is interrupted by his new second hired because Betty quit suddenly? If only someone would tell Peter, who ends our story wallowing in his room about his romance with Betty and the Spider-Man secret that is keeping them from being together. Amazing Spider-Man issue 35 because the legal system in the Marvel Universe is broken, in a different way to the way it's broken in real life, Mark Raxton, also known as the Molten Man, is let out of prison. He celebrates by immediately committing a crime, robbing a jewellery store in a mask to disguise his golden skin. The shopkeeper tries to shoot him, and the bullet does little against a man made of metal, and Raxton smashes the shopkeeper's gun in his fist as revenge. But the gunshot is enough to draw Spider-Man's attention. When he arrives on the scene, Raxton pretends to surrender and then sucker punches Spider-Man and flees, losing Spider-Man and shedding his costume in the process. No one can tie the Molten Man to this robbery. Except, it seems, for Peter Parker, who thinks to himself that it was like hitting metal when he punched that strange man. Metal? The Molten Man! It all makes sense. So he sneaks into Mark Raxton's apartment when he isn't there and places a spider tracer on his suit. After a number of false positives, Spider-Man eventually finds the Molten Man committing another crime. He takes pictures of the whole affair, from the disguise to the way the Molten Man breaks the lock with his fist before the spider signal announces Spider-Man's presence and he swings down to fight. The fight is literally an excuse to let the letterer Artie Simek go wild with sound effects and amounts to Spider-Man and the Molten Man just punching each other backwards and forwards. Eventually, the Molten Man runs home, only to find Spider-Man has beat him there, so they fight again, just in a different location. Spidey has also prepared a web rope while he was waiting, and with some fancy leaping and dodging, he manages to hog-tie the Molten Man, just like last time. But this time it's different, the Molten Man cries. There's no evidence that the Molten Man did anything. He was in disguise. But Raxton is soon proved wrong when Spider-Man delivers some newly developed photographs. Photographs that show everything, including the Molten Man shedding his disguise. Later, at the Daily Bugle, Peter Parker is ready to sell the rest of those photographs and bracing himself to see Betty Brant again. But instead, he runs into Betty's replacement, who, at Betty's request, gives him back a photograph of himself. Peter is convinced that she's run off to marry Ned Leeds and looks down at the ironic inscription on the photograph. To Betty, forever, Peter. He throws it in the trash and leaves. Images of Betty haunting him. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man issue 36. A meteor falls from the sky and a man called Norton G. Fester discovers it. He thinks that a fortune will soon be his as he can use the meteor to discover microscopic life from space. But, because no one will pay him for his research, he decides just to hit it with a hammer and chisel. The meteor sprays him with a gas that makes him super strong and able to jump slightly higher than usual, and so he instantly turns to crime. Meanwhile and elsewhere, Peter Parker has noticed that all the kids have friendship groups, but he's been too busy fighting Kraven and the Molten Man to do any of this friendship thing. But he's ready to try now, and things are looking good when he gets chatting with Sally Green, a girl who doesn't believe the rumours about Peter being a jerk. In fact, she he even made a bet with Gwen Stacy that he isn't that bad, and they're getting on well until she mentions how smart Peter is, and Peter starts acting like a jerk to her in response. Because he can't have people just liking him for his smarts. That's what Betty did. It looks like Gwen was right all along. Across town, Norton G. Fester is calling himself the Looter. With his new powers and a device that flashes a bright light, he robs a bank and then robs more and more in the following days. But soon the meteor is out of gas and he needs to find another one. Coincidentally, there's a meteor on display at the local museum. It's the same museum that Peter Parker is at, and also Gwen Stacy, who is following Peter, hoping that this will be a chance to get to know him more. So it's really unfortunate that the looter strikes on that very day, and Gwen learns that Peter is a coward, who runs away at the first sign of danger. Little does she know that he'll be returning moments later as the Amazing Spider-Man. 
Spidey and the looter fight one another, with the looter putting exhibits in harm's way to distract Spider-Man and stop him from hitting him. Eventually, the looter uses his flashing machine, blinding everybody in the room, except for Spider-Man, who closed his eyes under the mask. That good news for Spider-Man quickly turns bad when the looter pushes over a large exhibit on top of the blinded patrons. Spider-Man is able to save the day, but not without losing the looter. And when he becomes Peter Parker again, Gwen Stacy turns up her nose at this coward and continues to mock him at school the next day. Peter just can't win, but he does realise that the looter left empty handed, so he stakes out the museum. It pays off on the last day of the exhibit and Spider-Man is there once more to stop the looter from stealing the meteor. The looter is ready though and inflates a helium balloon floating up, up and away from our hero. But Spider-Man isn't done yet and he uses a flagpole to catapult himself up to the escaping thief. At first, Spidey holds on with webs, and when they fail, he grabs hold of the looter's foot, eventually swinging himself up to deliver one knockout blow. With the looter defeated, Spider-Man unmasks him, makes fun of his looks, and then deflates the balloon so they both descend back to Earth. Just as the police arrive, Spider-Man escapes to the rooftops and takes pictures for tomorrow's paper. Daredevil Issue 16 Foggy Nelson and Karen Page are sitting around watching the television. Since he's blind, Matt Murdock is listening to the television. On the news, they see Spider-Man fighting a new foe, the Masked Marauder. Spidey wins and captures Henchman, but the Marauder gets away. As Matt, Foggy and Karen compare Spider-Man to Daredevil, we cross town to see the Masked Marauder has a new plan and it involves dozens of fake Daredevils. He sends them out into the streets of New York with one goal, attack Spider-Man when they see him, and he blinds a Henchman when they question him. So, out in New York, Spider-Man is attacked by a billy club and then grappled with a wire. To Spidey, it's just Daredevil running away after each attack, but it's actually multiple henchmen dressed up as Daredevil. When the real Daredevil heads out on patrol, Spider-Man confronts him. For a moment, it looks like they're going to do the sensible thing and he's going to explain the situation, but no, Spider-Man attacks Daredevil. The fight on the rooftops draws the attention of the police and the Masked Marauder enacts the second part of what he calls Plan W. He uses a hydraulic tube to reach the 10th floor of a building and sends henchmen inside to steal the plans for the XB390 engine. When two police notice this weird truck with a pipe sticking out the top, the Masked Marauder blinds them with his Vizzy Blast. With the plans in his grasp, they retract the tubing and he races away in a sports car. Meanwhile, Daredevil and Spider-Man are still fighting, but the fight ends when Daredevil manages to rope Spider-Man to some piping and escape, suspecting that something weird must be going on. The next day, the news of the engine robbery makes the front page. Everyone is blaming Daredevil, except for the Daily Bugle, of course. Spider-Man thinks that Daredevil was in league with the Masked Marauder. Why else would he attack him? And so Peter Parker goes in search of the old Hornhead. When his spider sense goes off in the same way that it went off while he was fighting Daredevil, Spider-Man is sure that he has his guy. He looks into the the room to find both Matt Murdock and Foggy Nelson. Daredevil couldn't be the blind man, so Spider-Man smashes through the window and grabs Foggy instead, ready to teach him a lesson about working with villains. Matt Murdock wants to help, but he just can't do it without giving away his secret identity. And so the story is to be continued. Amazing Spider-Man issue 37 a man named Professor Strom is released from prison and he has only one thing on his mind, revenge. Watching this from the trees is Frederick Foswell, current journalist for the Daily Bugle and Professor Strom's ex-cellmate. He knows that Professor Strom is planning something, so when Strom gets into a car driven by another ex-inmate, Max Young, Foswell decides to tail them. Watching this from even more trees is just another guy who wants to get in the good graces of Strom by shooting Foswell. But Spider-Man intervenes with a fist. Spidey gets the guy to tail Foswell, who is tailing Strom. But before we can add another layer of tailing to this tail-heavy opening, the police pull Spidey's car over, what with it being stolen, and Spider-Man leaves this criminal driver to the police, losing Foswell in the process. And at the Daily Bugle, Foswell reveals that he also lost Professor Strom. Knowing that Foswell will keep up the search though, Peter slips a spider tracer in his hat. At school, Peter is confronted by an angry Gwen Stacy, and he somehow angrily flirts with her, enough that she starts to warm to him. And when Flash threatens to beat Peter up, and Peter calmly walks away, Gwen sees that he wasn't afraid at all. 
elsewhere, the first step of Professor Strom's revenge is ready to test. A robot that looks like a green tentacled monster. He uses it to break into the lab of the person he wants revenge on, hoping to cause lots of monetary damage. Spider-Man is, unfortunately, nearby and he swings in to help any trapped victims of a fire that is now growing. He doesn't get much time to be baffled by this new green robot, as he quickly finds himself tangled in the robot's tentacles. With the green robot pinning him down, Spidey does the only thing he can think of, rolling them both towards the fire, hoping that the heat will override the sensitive equipment inside his robot attacker. It works and Spider-Man makes a break for freedom, making it look like he started the fire to any passers-by. Strom seems entirely unfussed by this development, because he's already working on a second robot that looks and behaves entirely different to the first. And in the wreckage of the lab, we learn who Strom wants revenge on. Norman Osborn, a businessman, a friend of J. Jonah Jameson, and the father of Peter's classmate slash enemy, Harry Osborn. Norman knows that this fire wasn't caused by Spider-Man. This was the work of Professor Strom, who Norman cheated out of inventions in the past. Meanwhile and elsewhere, Frederick Foswell dons his patch disguise, eager to find out where Strom is hiding, and Spider-Man decides to tail Patch, since he can't find Foswell anyway. So they both end up in an alleyway, where Max Young, Strom's henchman, surprises Patch with a gun. They're also both in time to see the second robot, equipped with a laser face, march out into the world to get revenge on Norman. After Patch is led inside the building at gunpoint, Spider-Man quickly rescues him and leaves him inside a locked room with a gun before he goes after the second robot. That robot is attacking Norman Osborn when Spider-Man enters to save the day. The fight is pretty one-sided as Spider-Man spends most of it dodging the robot's attacks and laser head, but it's ended prematurely when Norman, the man that Spider-Man was saving, hits Spidey over the head and leaves him for dead. Norman was mad at Spider-Man for interrupting his plan, apparently. Luckily, Spider-Man plays dead convincingly enough that the robot doesn't finish him off, destroying the plant instead and heading back home to Professor Strom. Later, Spider-Man regains consciousness just in time to get back to Strom's base and surprise the second robot who's just arriving home, sliding low, grabbing its feet and slamming it into machinery. Max Young tries to escape, no way he's fighting Spider-Man, but he forgets that he left Foswell in the room, and Foswell has a gun. Back with Spidey and Strom, the Professor uses the head of his second robot, still firing a laser to attack Spider-Man, but our hero webs the head away and Strom surrenders. But, as Strom is about to reveal a secret, a rifle appears in the window, the rifle's owner keen to keep Strom quiet. Spider-Man is able to knock Strom out of the way, but the Professor has a heart attack and dies anyway, and the mysterious shooter is nowhere to be found when Spider-Man looks. There was no rope, no ladder, no helicopter. How did he do it? Later and elsewhere, Norman Osborn is given the good news by J. Jonah Jameson. Strom will no longer be a problem. But after Jonah leaves, we learn that Norman was the man with the rifle, and he vows to make Spider-Man pay for almost ruining everything. Daredevil Issue 17 As we saw last issue, Spider-Man thinks that Foggy Nelson is actually Daredevil, because it certainly couldn't be the blind man in the room, and he thinks that Daredevil is working with a villain to steal an engine, and that's why our hero is holding the lawyer out of a broken window. But he's soon reasoned with by Karen Page and realises that this approach won't get him anywhere, so he just makes some fat jokes at Foggy's expense and swings away, warning the man that he thinks is Daredevil that he'll be watching. As Peter swings away to tend to his Aunt May, Foggy Nelson takes advantage of the situation. He doesn't explicitly say that he's Daredevil, but he heavily implies it with the way that he speaks, in the hopes of getting Karen Page to like him. But Karen is busy thinking that Matt is secretly jealous of Foggy, because Matt wishes that he was actually Daredevil, and Karen wishes that Matt would think about her more, the way that she thinks that he thinks about Daredevil all the time. And Matt just wants them all to leave. When they finally do, Matt Murdock takes to the streets as Daredevil, heading to the company where the engine was stolen. Once there, he overhears that the engine could easily be turned into a weapon, and that while it has a special fuel, it could be fueled in a number of ways, which gives Daredevil an idea. With the promise of taking down Spider-Man, Daredevil gets J. Jonah Jameson onto the television to announce to the world how stupid Spider-Man is. You see, Spidey stole the engine, but he didn't steal the secret fuel that you definitely really, really need to fuel it. And Peter Parker hears this news and wants to protect that fuel. And the masked marauder hears the news and wants to steal that fuel. And so they're both heading for the same place. The motoring company hears the news too, so they double security. That night, the masked marauder always attacks at night. Spider-Man encounters Daredevil on the way to the world's motor center where the fuel is being held. Still thinking that Daredevil is working with the Masked Marauder, Spider-Man attacks. 
They exchange blows, with Daredevil taking the bulk of the hit, before their fight is interrupted by a golden blimp. But hey, it's fine, it's just an advertising blimp for World Motors. At least, that's what the building security think, until the masked marauder and his henchmen pop out and blind the security guards with eye lasers. Luckily, Spider-Man breaks away from Daredevil and swings over to save the day, beating up henchmen with ease. But as he reaches for the marauder himself, the masked marauder fires his eye lasers again and Spider-Man is blinded. Spidey is down and the masked marauder is ready to finish him off, but luckily Daredevil swoops in to the rescue. The marauder resorts, for a third time, to his favourite trick and blasts Daredevil with his eye laser. But he's then shocked that the laser doesn't seem to have any effect. He doesn't know that Daredevil is already blind. The Marauder's surprise gives Daredevil an advantage and he knocks the villain down, then uses a pistol to explode the escaping blimp. As more cops arrive on the scene and the motor owners blame Spider-Man, Daredevil can't find our superhero anywhere and he can't find the Masked Marauder. Spidey has fled, unhappy to be the villain again, and the Masked Marauder has stolen a guard's outfit and escaped in the chaos. We follow him down to the streets below, where he overhears Foggy and Karen, and learns that Foggy is actually Daredevil? What luck, the villain thinks, to learn the real identity of his arch nemesis, and he vows, in his thoughts, to get revenge. Amazing Spider-Man issue 38 there is a man called Joe Smith who wants to be a boxer. He gets himself a manager and gets himself in the ring and he loses. So he decides that he wants to be a wrestler and also loses badly. So finally his manager gets him a gig as an actor in a movie much to the derision of his boxing peers. In a monster alien costume, he's told to smash up the set in anger, and so he does, smashing debris into a light which topples into some chemicals, and Joe Smith is caught in the electrical current. He's alive, but he feels strange. Meanwhile and elsewhere, Peter Parker is at the Daily Bugle, witnessing yet another secretary quitting. He bumps into Ned Leeds there, the man that Peter thinks Betty has run off with, and learns that Ned also doesn't know where she is either. The two men get aggressive with each other before Jonah splits them up and Peter walks off to mourn Betty's absence. Elsewhere, Joe Smith is starting his next scene, where he has to beat up some stunt performers. But that funny feeling turns into rage and super strength, and he fights out of the set and into the street. He eventually runs into Spider-Man and is able to tear Spidey's web and defeat our hero. Spider-Man didn't even learn his name. Still feeling odd, Joe Smith flees with his manager. Elsewhere again, Norman Osborn puts on a fake beard and some sunglasses and offers a handsome reward to the underworld to take care of Spider-Man. He offers half up front, literal notes that he has cut in half. Later, as Spider-Man is swinging around to clear his head, after a day of taunts from Flash Thompson and a weird encounter with some protesters, he gets attacked by some criminals who are looking to collect the reward. They don't stand a chance. And as Spidey fights, Joe Smith wakes up, feeling strange once more. He shoves his manager aside and heads to his old gym. He wants revenge on the fighters that used to mock him, and they gladly give him that fight, and the gym erupts into a brawl. Swinging past the gym, after defeating the criminals from before, Spider-Man finds that mystery man who defeated him earlier. He swings down to help put an end to this gym fight, but the boxers have also heard about the reward, and they turn on Spider-Man. So Spider-Man takes on everybody, including the superpowered Joe Smith, across a page of dramatic lettering, before Joe comes to his senses. Whatever effect the chemical had has worn off, and his manager shows up to tell him that the producers were so impressed by Joe's performance that they wanted to give him an expanded role. Meanwhile, Spidey is fighting off an alleyway of people looking to collect on a reward. He's mocked by a dummy that looks like Ned Leeds. He once again misses Mary Jane, who's leaving just as he arrives, and he has to watch on the news as this guy named Joe gets a five-year contract in Hollywood, and Spider-Man just gets mocked. Life just isn't fair for Peter, so he goes to bed. Amazing Spider-Man issue 39. In a secret base, the Green Goblin is plotting vengeance. Enough time has passed for him to surprise Spider-Man, and he plans to learn Spidey's secret identity and reveal it to the world. And what is Spider-Man up to? Well, he has a cold, so he goes to see a doctor. The doctor gives him some medicine, but also gives him a warning. Peter's Aunt May is still weak and recovering from her surgery. She's so weak that any sudden shock would prove fatal. But hey, it's a good job that Peter leads a quiet, unassuming existence, right? 
Peter is so worried about his aunt that he blanks Flash Thompson and Gwen Stacy, who are so desperately trying to be nice to him at college. And after his father, Norman Osborn, is rude and dismissive to Harry, Harry does the same blanking. Kindly, Peter reaches out to Harry at the science lab, and even though Harry snaps at him, Harry soon apologises and a friendship starts to blossom. Later, as Spider-Man, Peter sees a robbery on the roof of a building. It seems like a super obvious crime, almost a trap, almost begging for a Spider-Man intervention. But he dives in anyway, taking down the goons with ease. He's eventually able to move the criminals away from the elevator, giving the public a chance to escape before he remembers his aunt at home and how a shock might kill her and how Peter coming home injured would absolutely be a shock. He stops long enough to give the criminals a chance to fire a gas at Spidey, a gas that will weaken all of his senses, including his spider sense, at least according to the Green Goblin, who is spying on the situation from the skies above. But it doesn't weaken Spidey's punches, and Spider-Man quickly defeats the criminals and takes photographs for the bugle. As he decostumes and returns to his regular clothes, Peter worries about the gas, worried why it didn't work or worried that it might have and he doesn't notice the looming presence of the Green Goblin, who now learns that Spider-Man is just a kid. And after Peter goes into the bugle, makes peace with Ned Leeds by officially letting Betty go, and makes money from Jonah by selling his photos, Green Goblin's spying equipment allows him to discover Spider-Man's real name, Peter Parker. And so, at Peter's house, the Green Goblin descends from the sky and reveals his information. Worried that Aunt May may look outside and die, Peter springs into action, but quickly realises that he's not wearing his web shooters, and so he's caught in a black cloud that the Goblin fires at him. It's a fortunate cloud, because it's at that exact moment that Aunt May does look out the window and sees only fog, and not the fight that's going on behind it. Peter is able to dodge some of the Green Goblin's attacks, but he's eventually blinded by sparks and caught in a gas grenade's explosion. He's stunned long enough for the Goblin to tie him up in steel rope and lift him unmasked into the sky. The Goblin flies him on his glider to the waterfront, to his secret base, and monologues to the captured youth, angry at the very idea that Spider-Man might have beaten him, calling their past encounters accidents. But since Peter will be dead soon, he may as well know the identity of the man who killed him. And so, the Green Goblin takes off his mask and reveals the face of… Norman Osborn, Harry Osborn's dad. Surprise! Amazing Spider-Man Issue 40 to catch up quickly, the Green Goblin knows that Spider-Man is Peter Parker, and Peter knows that the Green Goblin is Norman Osborn, father of his classmate. Aunt May will die if she gets any kind of shock, and Peter is captured by the Green Goblin, tied to a chair at a secret base on the waterfront, and that's where we pick up. As Peter struggles with the bonds that bind him, he mentions Harry Osborn, which strikes a nerve with the unmasked Norman. When Norman tells Peter not to mention Harry again, Peter does the opposite, taunting Norman by claiming that he cares very little about his son. It leads to Norman monologuing about his past. He says that his wife and Harry's mother died when Harry was young, and that Norman gave everything to becoming successful, to provide for young Harry. This included betraying Professor Strom, the creator of robots from a few issues back, and ultimately led to him being estranged from Harry himself. He was now too busy trying to be successful and had forgotten the reason why. Then, in Strom's notes, he found details for a formula. When Norman created it, it exploded on him, and he spent weeks in the hospital. The doctors were able to save his life, but couldn't reach the damage done deep in his brain. Damage that Norman felt made him smarter and stronger, but damage that also made him cruel and more dismissive of Harry. Once recovered, he became the Green Goblin. Green because it was his favourite colour, and went after Spider-Man as a show of force to get the gangs in line. Elsewhere, Aunt May is telling Anna Watson how worried she is that her Peter hasn't come home. It's just not like him. She asks Anna to call the Daily Bugle, but J. Jonah Jameson has no good answers and only anger for Anna. So instead, Anna calls May's doctor, keen to keep May calm. And elsewhere once more, Betty Brandt is in the train station, ready to come back to New York to face Peter and Ned, but haunted by images of Spider-Man. I'm back with Spider-Man once more, and Green Goblin's monologue has turned to the times that he fought against Spider-Man. He uses a device to cast pictures of their fight, to prove that the Green Goblin was never defeated. 
it was always luck that Spider-Man won. He'd never really beaten the Goblin. And so it's with that arrogance that, just as Peter is getting free of his bonds, the Green Goblin frees him instead and tells him to put his Spider-Man costume on. He wants to have a real fight to show that the Green Goblin will always defeat Spider-Man, even at his full strength. When they fight, it's in tents and in close quarters, with the Green Goblin tossing bombs and Spidey deflecting them with webbing. Eventually, Spider-Man is stunned, but when the Goblin flies close, Spider-Man knocks him from his glider and destroys it, and we learn that he was only pretending to be stunned. The Green Goblin returns the favour though, also pretending to be knocked down, only to whip a broken electrical cable at our hero. Eventually, Spider-Man's agility gives him the advantage, and he knocks the Green Goblin down, realising too late that the Goblin is falling into electricity and chemicals. When Spidey checks to see if the Goblin is dead, he instead finds a Norman who doesn't know who Spider-Man is, and who still thinks that Harry is in high school. He's seemingly forgotten the last few years. A fire is raging now, and as the fire brigade come to the rescue, Peter changes Norman back to his civilian identity, burning the goblin suit in the fire, and carries Norman outside. He claims that Norman helped him defeat the Green Goblin, and then he swings away. At home, Peter finds the doctor's car waiting outside, and finds that May has been sedated. The doctor scolds Peter for being so reckless, but only thinking of himself before he leaves. But Aunt May is more worried about Peter than herself. He's warm from his battle in the fire, but Aunt May assumes that it's the flu, and so she puts him up in bed and gives him the broth and the care so that he can recover. And elsewhere, also recovering in bed, is Norman, with Harry by his side. He can't remember some of his past, but he's keen to make the future a good one. For both of them. Amazing Spider-Man issue 41. Aunt Anna has an offer for Peter's Aunt May. She wants May to move in with her. They'd save some money and they'd keep each other company, but it's an offer that Aunt May can refuse because she worries that Peter is too frail to do without her. Meanwhile, Peter Parker, the frail and fragile nephew, is buying a motorcycle. But to do so, he needs J. Jonah Jameson to approve a loan, which, to everyone's surprise, Jonah does? He thinks that if Peter has a debt, Jonah will be able to buy his pictures for cheap. As Jonah hangs up the phone, he reverts to his usual state of being, a critic of Spider-Man. His son, John Jameson, tries to get his dad to ease up on Spider-Man. After all, Spider-Man saved his life. John is there to explain what happened to him on his last trip to space. He explains that after a spacewalk, some strange spores drifted into the capsule with him and clung to his spacesuit. He was subjected to days of tests until the spores finally faded away. From that moment on, he's been followed and guarded by the space agency. In fact, there are two men right outside the door. Meanwhile and elsewhere, a man in a rhino costume is charging through the desert. At a border checkpoint, he smashes through the guards and a concrete building and deflects bullets off his bulletproof hide on his way to a secret destination. Back with Peter Parker, and our hero bumps into Betty Brant, newly back in town. They sit down for a coffee together, but find that all their chemistry is gone. Every conversation is sheer torture, and all that love that they felt for each other seems to have vanished. But when Ned Leeds shows up, Betty lights up, and it's clear that the two were meant to be together. Peter realises that he never had anything in common with Betty, she was just the first girl that he loved. After Peter leaves Betty together with Ned, he sees the rhino on a TV screen, heading to New York, and then runs into Jonah saying goodbye to his son, almost running afoul of the federal agents that are following John. Peter's now caught up on all the plot threads so far, and when he thanks Jonah for vouching for him, Jonah demands pictures of the rhino as thanks, and so Peter is now tied into the plot. Peter wonders about John's bodyguards, and about finding a place for himself, though he could never leave frail Aunt May, and about what the rhino is after as he heads home to study. But that study is interrupted by a radio report about the rhino in New York. Across the city, John Jameson's bodyguards are under attack, and suddenly the rhino smashes into the room with John and Jonah in it. The rhino grabs and kidnaps John, and Spidey arrives just as Jonah is explaining all of this to the wounded agents. Luckily, Spider-Man catches up to Rhino and John, and the fight that follows is one of strength versus speed. This isn't a villain that Spider-Man can just punch, he almost breaks his arm when he tries. Spidey learns that the Rhino is Russian, and wants to sell John Jameson to the highest bidder, and that there are plenty of countries who will pay top dollar during the space race. 
Spidey also learns that the Rhino is a villain he can dodge, and so he does, hoping to tire the Russian villain out. He taunts and avoids, leading the Rhino to crash into lampposts and phone booths before Spidey webs the Rhino's feet up, wraps his legs around the Rhino's neck, and slams the Rhino down into the ground. The Rhino stands again, but it's temporary, and he falls back down and falls unconscious. The police arrive just in time, followed by J. Jonah Jameson, who demands that Spidey be arrested, even when his own son confirms that Spider-Man has saved his life, again. As the police try, with no luck to remove the Rhino suit, Peter Parker regrets not taking any photographs. But the next day, he rides into town on his new motorbike. It makes him feel so confident that he hits on Gwen Stacy, but she never saw him as the motorcycle type and she rebuffs his advances. Instead, Peter rides to a woman who does love him, Aunt May, where he finds Anna leaving just when he arrives, and May tells Peter that Anna has invited them both for dinner on Sunday night. After avoiding her for months, Peter is finally going to get to meet Anna's niece. He's finally going to meet Mary Jane Watson. Marvel Mini Book Amazing Spider Man. Marvel Mini Books were sold in gumball machines across the United States and each came in six different colors. You could argue that they were the very first variant covers. They were also only two centimeters tall, the size of a cent. The Guinness World Record has them down as the smallest comic book ever produced. Their size means that it would be just as quick for me to read the story as it would to recap it. So enjoy this very, very short audiobook. Spiders are usually rather unpopular. Bet not one of your friends is a spider. Most spiders aren't nice. But Peter Parker is, and he's a spider man. He was bitten by a very special spider that had passed through a radioactive field. Instead of getting mighty sick, Peter gained special powers. A spider has amazing strength for its size, so Peter has this amazing strength. Spiders can crawl up the steepest inclines, and so can Peter. He can climb and explore anywhere. Spiders spin webs which they use to climb on and to trap enemies. Peter made a gadget he wears on his wrist that shoots a web-like material. Using his webbing strung between buildings, he can almost fly. He also uses it to wrap up the bad guys. And like the spider, Peter has a radar-like sense that warns him of danger. With all of these new talents, naturally it would be fun to become a superhero. Once, he was checking on some known crooks. They were counting the loot from a robbery. Spider-Man subdued them, wrapped the jewels in some webbing, and off he went. But the bundle got caught on a flagpole. Along came this fellow in a cape, another superhero, and he saw the loot. He swooped down and grabbed the bundle and didn't even say hi. You see, there's an awful lot of competition among superheroes. Hey, what's this story about you being born in 1843? Yep, and a few years later, my parents moved to 1845, right next door. Say, why'd that old lady hit you when you helped her cross the street? Well, my mistake. She really didn't want to cross. The Amazing Spider-Man Annual Issue 3 The Avengers are deciding if they want Spider-Man to join their team. Hawkeye says yes because he digs Spidey's style, and Wasp votes no because she hates anything to do with spiders. And in the end, they decide they first need to find out the type of person that Spider-Man is. And so, they contact Daredevil with a powerful audio signal of Morse code, and question him on his opinions of Spider-Man. Daredevil gives his highest recommendation, and so they now all agree Spider-Man is approved to be tested. All the heroes fly out into New York to find our web-slinging hero, but it's Thor that finds him. Thor thunderously summons Spidey to meet them at Avengers HQ, explaining that Spider-Man is to submit to a trial to join the Avengers, and that he has 24 hours to decide. At home, Peter Parker runs an errand for Aunt May to get new medication for her, and contemplates the pros and cons of joining the Avengers. As a loner, he can choose what he does and where he goes, but as an Avenger, it could mean a whole new life for him, but probably a lot harder to keep his identity a secret. And if Aunt May ever found out, the shock would kill her. In the end, he decides that he must have his powers for a reason, and that Aunt May would understand if she knew, and so he goes to Avengers Tower, and he meets all of the Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Hawkeye, Giant Man, the Wasp, and Thor. 
But when he asks what his task will be, the Avengers tell him that they haven't come up with one yet. And so Spider-Man loses his temper and fights every member of the Avengers from Hawkeye to Cap until they bring him to his senses. But the fighting gives Iron Man an idea for a task. You see, the Hulk has been spotted in the city of New York and the Avengers are way too busy to go after him themselves. And so all Spider-Man has to do is bring the Hulk back to the Avengers. Easy, right? Spider-Man swings off way too confident and doesn't even hear why the Avengers want the Hulk. After swinging around the city for a while and unable to track down the big green Hulk, Spider-Man finds himself thirsty. And so he climbs into J. Jonah Jameson's office and helps himself to some water from Jonah's water cooler as Jonah rants and tries to call the police. And Spidey's in that very office when Foswell enters and shares the news that the Hulk has been spotted by a Gamma Ray Research Center. And so Spidey swings off to find his quarry without even a goodbye. And there he is, the Hulk. And since he won't go with Spidey willingly, the two of them fight. Spider-Man dodges thrown bricks and a diving Hulk and hopes to find a weak spot. Only problem is, it doesn't look like the Hulk has one. But fortunately, when a stray punch breaks through a gamma ray shielding wall, Hulk transforms and suddenly Spider-Man is face to face with Bruce Banner. Banner explains his backstory before starting to turn green once more, but not before begging Spider-Man to destroy him. Now fighting the Hulk once again, Spidey suspects that he hasn't quite reached full strength yet and takes advantage of that. He knocks the Hulk down and webs him up and wins the fight. But with an intellect like Banner's inside, Spider-Man can't bring himself to turn over the Hulk to the Avengers. He assumes they want to hold him prisoner or torture him or worse, and so Spider-Man lets him go. Or at least he tries, but the Hulk easily breaks out of the webbing and wanders off dazed and confused. Later, at Avengers headquarters, Spider-Man tells the Avengers that he just couldn't find the Hulk, so he won't be joining the Avengers anytime soon. As he heads home, he contemplates the fact that he could have won easily, could have taunted the Hulk and led him to the Avengers, but instead, he just had to do the right thing and remain a loner forever. Why does nothing seem to work out right for him? Amazing Spider-Man issue 42 it's not an imposter, and this isn't some dream. This story starts with Spider-Man, the very real Spider-Man, robbing a bank. There can be no denying it. He swings away with a bag of money, arrives at a bridge, and tosses that very bag into the river. J. Jonah Jameson was right. Spider-Man is a menace. But where is Jonah while all of this is going down? He's with his son John at the airport. They're about to say goodbye to one another when John Jameson is overcome by a fever and soon finds himself with super strength and growing out of his normal human-sized clothes. When he's checked out by NASA scientists, they explain that the spores that infected him in space have given him superhuman powers. He's now super strong and can leap great distances, as if he was on the moon. This must have been why the Rhino tried to kidnap him in the previous issue, but... Overusing these powers will put too much of a strain on his body. They have Tony Stark build him a special suit that will weigh him down and regulate his heartbeat, keeping him safe from overexertion. Then they congratulate Jonah on being the father of a brand new superhero. A superhero, Jonah thinks. After he spent his whole career disparaging superheroes, how can he support his son and also keep on hating Spider-Man? But he gets a phone call from Frederick Froswell telling him about Spidey's robbery and Jonah hatches a plan. His son, this brand new superhero, can capture Spider-Man and bring him to justice. And so that's exactly where John goes. Meanwhile and elsewhere, the rhino is unconscious and being studied. It seems that his thick skin is no suit and is impossible to remove. When he awakens and wreaks havoc, his captors are forced to use a tranquilizer gas on him. They're not sure how they'll hold him in the long term, but he'll be standing trial soon with Foggy Nelson as his defense lawyer. Elsewhere once more, and Peter Parker accepts a party invitation from Gwen Stacy before quickly rejecting it when he realises that he's already promised his Aunt May that he'd come for dinner on Sunday and meet the fabled Mary Jane Watson. Ugh, he thinks. He'd much rather meet the Hulk, and he'd probably be better looking too. As he's swinging around upset, he comes across John Jameson on a rooftop, looking to take Spidey down. Spider-Man webs him up, hoping to explain that he didn't really rob the bank, but just as he tries, John Jameson breaks free. Then Spidey tries knocking him down long enough to explain, but his fist feels like it's hitting iron, and even a webbed sack of bricks does nothing to stop Jameson. And so, Spidey is forced to flee after webbing up John's face and slamming him to the ground, and he just has to 
think about what he would have explained to John Jameson. That he'd heard a money bag ticking while he was in a bank, and that it, he knew it was a bomb, and that the only way to stop it was to steal it and throw it off of the nearest bridge. Thinking about his crime leads him to J. Jonah Jameson's office, and there he explains to Jonah that he didn't steal anything important, that he should call his son off, and that the bank can confirm that they counted the money and that no actual money was stolen. And even though Jonah wants to blame Spider-Man, even though he shouldn't just do what Spider-Man has asked him to do, Jonah does call the bank because he's a good journalist and he does confirm that Spider-Man didn't steal anything. And so, when John arrives in his office, fuming, Jonah is able to tell his son about Spider-Man's innocence. But John is mad now, both in the angry sense and in the his powers are making him irrational sense, and he storms after Spider-Man anyway, to show Spider-Man that John is the best superhero in town. And when the two find each other once again outside a power station, John pulls the weights off his shoes so that he can leap after Spider-Man at full strength. But Spidey has a plan and he lures John onto the rooftop and allows John to grab him next to a skylight. By simply shifting his weight, Spider-Man sends them both falling into the station's interior. Then he's able to taunt and knock John straight into an electrical current. The shock kills whatever was in John's system, shrinking him down to human size once more, and Spidey flees once a medical team turns up, and Jonah starts ranting that this was all Spider-Man's fault that his son went crazy. The next day, Peter is looking forward to a relaxing Sunday. He even thinks about calling up Gwen, when he's brought down to Earth by May, reminding him about that dinner with the Watsons. And so he gets dressed and heads over, daydreaming about Gwen while they wait for Mary Jane to arrive. When the doorbell finally sounds, Peter reluctantly gets up to answer and is greeted by one of the most gorgeous women he has ever met, who delivers one of the most iconic lines in comic book history. Face it, Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. The Amazing Spider-Man issue 43. The Rhino is escaping. With his thick hide, not even bullets can stop him, and he charges out and through a wall. Elsewhere, and less dramatically, in the Daily Bugle offices, Betty and Ned have finally got engaged, but Jonah has no time for that. He wants a good story for his newspaper. And completely oblivious to both of these facts is Peter Parker, who is having dinner with his aunt, her friend, and Mary Jane Watson. And he's only got eyes for her. They flirt, and he learns that she's an actress, that she just needs the world to catch up onto this fact. And then she dances to music playing on the television, because everything to her is a party. Unfortunately, the world disagrees and her music is interrupted by breaking news. The rhino has escaped, just like we saw at the beginning. Just as Peter is working out a way to ditch his aunt and Mary Jane, MJ suggests that they should hop on his bike and go and find this rhino person, that she bets he would be a real swinger. And so they do. Meanwhile, across the city, Foggy Nelson, the rhino's lawyer, sulks because he wished that he had a juicy tax case instead. And Matt Murdock broods because he wanted the rhino case and he should probably let Spider-Man face the rhino first rather than suiting up as Daredevil. I guess Spider-Man called dibs. Does this have any impact on the plot? Not at all. Elsewhere, the rhino is waiting around for Spider-Man to appear to get his revenge and he uses that time to reminisce about his backstory and fill us in on how he became the rhino. He was just an ordinary hired hood, too stupid to betray anybody, and he agreed to undergo experiments. Those experiments lasted months, and he was granted super strength and given a molecular adhesive as a second skin. But, unknown to his bosses, he was also made smarter. Smart enough to betray somebody, and so he did betray them. As the rhino is thinking about his past, Peter Parker and MJ arrive on the scene, and he explains that he needs to take some photographs and leaves her in the crowd. He Spider-Man's up, sets up a camera, and confronts the Rhino. The Rhino is faster than expected, and soon Spider-Man finds himself playing a dodging game, unable to do any real damage. The Rhino realizes this, that Spider-Man will always just stay out of reach, and so he decides to bring Spidey to him. He does this by charging through a building, like a Rhino, and towards the curious crowd gathered on the other side. That crowd that has MJ in it. This has the desired effect. Spider-Man is forced to get close, slamming the rhino into the road, but it means that he's too close to the rhino charging and is knocked prone. As the rhino builds up momentum to charge again, a lone policeman bravely moves forward and pulls Spider-Man out of harm's way. And since nothing could have survived, the rhino assumes that he must have killed Spider-Man and he stomps away. In the crowd, this whole scene was witnessed by the Daily Bugle's star reporter, Frederick Foswell, who can't wait to tell J. Jonah Jameson about what happened. 
As Spider-Man becomes Peter Parker once more and collects his camera, he finds a piece of the rhino's hide in the alleyway, which gives him an idea. After dropping Mary Jane back at home, Peter sells his photographs to Jonah, who loves them so much that he offers Peter a bonus, his own key to the washroom. He then delivers the piece of hide to Dr. Kurt Connors, the scientist that sometimes becomes an evil lizard, and the two of them work through the night on something that will stop the rhino. With the formula completed, Spidey heads to the bedside of John Jameson, recovering after the events of last issue, and waits for the rhino. He figures that the rhino will still be looking to capture John, spore-powered or not. And Spider-Man is proved right when the rhino charges, like a rhino, into John's hospital room. Spidey moves quickly, smashing through the window and webbing the rhino up. While the rhino tries to tear the webbing off, it sticks to his skin and soon melts it away, burning away the rhino's protection. With one punch, Spidey takes the villain down, and with a salute to John Jameson, he leaves. Later, Peter bumps into Gwen, Harry and Flash, and learns that Flash has been called up to serve in the army. And at home, he finds out that Aunt May is feeling weak, and hasn't been refilling her prescription. Probably because she doesn't have any money, and Peter curses himself for his carefree spending on a motorbike of all things. To save money, he cancels a date with Mary Jane, who acts like she doesn't care at all and he spends the night brooding all about his life. X-Men issue 27. The X-Men, wearing brand new costumes, are fighting a man called the Mimic for the second time. Like his name suggests, he can mimic all of their powers, and so he uses Cyclops' optic blast and Iceman's ice powers and Beast's agility and strength to defeat all four of the X-Men. The X-Men barely put up a fight, like they were holding back. With the X-Men defeated, we flash back a few days to understand how this fight came to be. Angel has been wounded last issue by a stray optic blast, and Cyclops is feeling super guilty, doubting whether he wants to be leader anymore. And elsewhere at university, Jean Grey has quit the X-Men and is enraptured by a guy named Ted who was just really good at sports. As they talk, the chemistry building explodes behind them and a student called Cal Rankin is pulled out. He's known to Jean as the Mimic, that person that they defeated at the start. She thinks that he's forgotten all about his mimicking abilities, but it seems that the explosion has awoken those memories. Elsewhere once more, a villain known as the Puppet Master wants revenge on the Fantastic Four. He can make dolls of anybody to control them, and so he attempts to make one of Professor Xavier, only to find it impossible to hold due to the Professor's mental defences. As for the Professor, he's astral projecting around the world. With Angel injured, Cyclops losing faith, and Jean quit, he's looking to bolster the ranks of his X-Men. At first, he tries asking Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch to join, but they can't join the X-Men because they're Avengers now. When Iceman and Beast stumble upon Spider-Man, our hero, stopping a bank robbery, they are psychically instructed to ask him to join the X-Men. He rudely turns them down, too upset about how his Avengers trial went, and swings away. Later, the X-Men arrive to pick up Jean Grey and hope to bump into Johnny Storm to ask him to join the X-Men. But instead of Johnny, they find Cal Rankin, the Mimic, and they invite him to join the X-Men instead, which gives Puppet Master, watching on a screen, an idea. Back at the mansion, Professor Xavier announces that Cyclops no longer wants to be leader and that Cal will be instead, which is the perfect time for the Puppet Master to take control of the Mimic. And we're back to the fight that started it all. With the X-Men defeated, the Mimic goes after the Fantastic Four and Professor X reveals that they were holding back because the Professor was psychically making them. He knew that the Puppet Master was behind this all along and wanted them to look defeated so they could catch the villain by surprise. The X-Men fly out to defeat the Puppet Master, followed by the still injured Angel. They arrive, defeat his golem by destroying the ground underneath it, and then they're halted in their arrival by the Mimic, controlled to protect the Puppet Master. However, thanks to having Xavier's abilities, the Mimic is able to resist his commands just long enough for the Angel to grab the Mimic statue that controls him and smash it on the ground. While the X-Men tend to Angel, who definitely shouldn't have been fighting villains in his condition, the Mimic flees and considers himself condemned, always forced to steal another's powers. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw here, a like and a follow helps it get out into the world and seen by more people. If you haven't seen them already, there are compilations of 1962 through to 1965, and I do a new recap every Thursday, so continuing that journey of reading every Spider-Man ever. Thank you for joining me on the journey.